And before I start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and I pay respect to the elders past and present and I extend respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Welcome to our third Griffith University Library Lightning Talks. My name is Maureen Sullivan and I'm the Director of Library and Learning Services here at Griffith. We are, with the Lightning Talks, travelling around each campus and so far our talks have been at Logan and the Gold Coast and now we've turned up at, Lo at Nathan, Logan again. Thank you for coming along, it's great to see such a good crowd. So first of all, what are Lightning Talks? Soapbox oratory and speakers forums are alive and well in many libraries around the world. Our Griffith University Lightning Talks invite our own academics and other experts to speak briefly about their work. We see them as a mechanism for opening communication channels outside of the classroom, journals or books. We see them as another way to bring the very important work that we do alive and the audiences, if you like, directly into the room with the experts. So you will get a chance to, answer, to ask questions at the end of our four talks today. So, why are we holding these talks? Griffith University has always been a university based on inclusion. Our libraries play an important role in university culture. Indeed, the library itself can be seen as a conduit between staff, students and schools and, at, and the university more broadly. We have a display here of some of our author's works, which I'm not sure where it is. It's on the table now. It was on a trolley before. They did that to confuse me. Um, so please take a look at them um, at the end of the, the session if you have time. And if you haven't already, please borrow some from the library. We also have a lucky door prize. And we want to thank Griffith Reviews manager, Dr. Karen Hands who's here this morning, um, for providing us with this wonderful prize. And of course, to John Taig, um, the from Griffith Review. So I'm going to draw the prize, and someone was going to bring me... They might need to wait. Can we have it at the end? That's not what my notes say. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. The best laid plans. Okay, so today, as I mentioned, is round three of our Lightning Talk series. And today is called Turbulent Times and Populism. We do, of course, live in turbulent times, and our speakers will certainly present some fascinating points about this. But a few things already spring to mind. Brexit, Trump, fake news, sensational media framing, dare I say, um, citizenship. Um, I won't continue as we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to tell us all about turbulent and populist times. So let me introduce our speakers. First of all, we have Associate Professor Georgina Murray. Give the, give the crowd a wave. <laughs> Georgina is an adjunct associate professor in humanities at Griffith University. She's the author of many articles, papers and five books. Her latest books include Women at Work, Labor Segmentation and, Regula and Regulation with David Perez and Think Tanks, Key Spaces Within Global Structures of Power with Al Alessandra salas Porus. Her research has focused on several areas of sociology including networks of power, gender, climate change, work and sustainability. She has worked as an academic in Australia, China, South Africa, Norway and New Zealand. Wow. Today Georgina will discuss how relevant Marx is to getting a decent job because we all want decent jobs and we have to make sure that we have a political, social and economic structure that supports decent work. Following Georgina will be Dr Duncan Macdonald. Duncan is a senior lecturer in the School of Government and International Relations here at Griffith University. He was previously a Mary Curie Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence, which is a job I want. <laughs> Duncan's main research interests are political parties, populism and Euroscepticism. Today Duncan will discuss the rise of right-wing populism internationally and compare Australia's one nation with a more successful right-wing populist in Western Europe. Next will be Dr John Taig. 
who is the managing editor of Griffith Review. John worked as a journalist for 25 years in London, contributing to The Independent on Sunday, BBC Radio 4, The Times Literary Supplement and NME, among many others. In Australia, he has worked for the Australian Associated Press and the ABC before joining Griffith Review. John will discuss how the populist phenomenon is reinvigorating critical discussion and debate, bringing a new urgency to both journalistic reporting and political writing. And finally, we will be hearing from Dr. Susanna Chamberlain, wave, <laughs> who is a lecturer from the School of Humanities, Language and Social Sciences. Susanna comes from a varied background and her interests are broad. She was in family therapy for 25 years and worked in academia concurrently. She has worked for the universities of Melbourne, Adelaide, Monash, Macquarie, ANU, Canberra, QUT, UQ and Massey in New Zealand. Her teaching areas have spanned history, sociology, politics, indigenous studies, human rights, social enterprise, gender studies, communication and anthropology. Yes. <sighs> I'm exhausted. Susanna will attempt to answer the question, what the heck is populism? Each, each talk will be lightning fast at 10 minutes and when you'll have some time left at the end of the entire session for questions and discussion. We encourage you to tweet throughout if you are so inclined and be sure to tag the library at Griffith Library and use the hashtag lightning talks. We have a timekeeper, Andy, who's over there and he will let each of the speakers know when there's a minute to go. And so um, enjoy, have your questions ready for the end um, and welcome to our first speaker. Thank you Maureen and thank you everybody for coming and particularly thank you to Sarah Casey who, for love of whom we are, I am and I'm sure Susanna is doing these talks. So, so thank you very much for coming. Okay, so this is lightning fast. Andy, remember you're my friend. <laughs> okay, so, um, and this is David Peets who is going to be the illustrator because I'm so used to doing everything by PowerPoint. I need PowerPoint. And so he's got a few illustrations. So he's gonna stand there and illustrate as we go along. Okay, so 10 minutes. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, so everybody in this room is interested in work everybody works and everybody probably understands that it's got undergone a, a huge transition how do we relate that to the popular time and how do we think of it in terms of a political context okay so what we've got then is first illustration we've got populism and i know duncan's going to talk about this and others are going to talk about it in more detail but we've got a populist situation that exists currently in the um we can see it most obviously in the united states and if you look here, you, we've, got this, we've got the problem of, of what's happening in um, Pyongyang and with, um, with Kim Jong-il at the moment in terms of looking at the fear that they're engendering, they're engendering. And we've got the situation that's become evident in Charlottesville in terms of populism. We've got this, which is you're all familiar with, which is the Nazis rising. Are you familiar? You won't be familiar with that, but it's just to point out, where do you think this is? Can you see it? Very quickly. Can you, and can, put your hand up if you can see where you think it is. Yeah, at the back. <laughs> Anybody? Where do you think this is? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got it. Okay, this is meant to look like Nazi Germany because it was 1934, it was the same time, but it was actually in Madison Square Garden. So the point is that this sort of populism that's now arising out of, um, out of uh, um, America is not new. It's, um, it's indicative of a of, a, of a, something that's an underlying dynamic. And that underlying dynamic is that people are really unhappy. People are really experiencing um, the inequalities of uh, global wealth. For instance, we've got Oxfam is talking about 62 individuals own more than uh, than half of the population of the world. And that 1% of the top owners of wealth own more than collectively the 99% of, of the poor and of the rest of the world. So we, what we're, we're moving towards is a huge imbalance. At the top, we've got a lot of wealth 
And at the bottom, it, people, um, you might be different from me, but I'm sure you're not, you're experiencing um, the insecurity of uh, casual work. Uh, we've got, uh, jo Joshua Haley was talking about one in five um, uh, Australians in our casuals, and that gets to one in two if you're between 15 and 24. So there's a lot of insecurity. That, that means um, Wilkinson talks about the, the effect on health. It makes people um, uh, who suffer poverty are more likely to be obese. They're more likely to um, to have uh, early pregnancies. They're more likely to have mental health issues. They're more likely to be alcoholics. All these cheerful things. They're more likely to be drug addicts because of the pressures of poverty. Okay, second one. So what we've got then is we've got a huge inequality, we've got a huge difference. So what, that mean, what does that mean in terms of work? And so if we look at work today, to be in Australia, to be a casual worker, and uh, the universities are full of casual workers, uh, to be a casual worker is a problem. It's a problem in terms of your sense of security, your sense of health, your sense of welfare, your sense of being able to get a house, your sense of being able to get a mortgage. A whole lot of things go with that insecurity. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Peets. <laughs> okay, so um, if you look at what one of the manifestations of this new, new insecurity, you've got Uber. So people are saying, okay, it's not that bad. We've got um, we've got economic um, uh, neoliberalism, but we've got Uber. We've got Uber as a solution. Okay, so Uber, we've got. Um, the, I think it's, we've got now, we've got uh, four, it operates in 400 com uh, countries. Uh, it operates in um, ways that, um, I have to, to read this, it is uh, it started off as a luxury brand, it's now become an economic brand, it does, it operates more cheaply than taxis, it's trying to undercut taxis. What does this mean for the worker? Um, you've got the, all the workers are, uh, from uh, they've done um, surveys on it. The workers are usually um, blue-collar workers that have been that have been <laughs> blue-collar workers, and the executives are um, uh, financiers and from business. And the workers are they're having to do uh, work that is um, because the market is now because the Uber managers are trying to get more and more people into the market. They've got a situation where they are often idle for between um, a third and a half um, of their time, and the, their pay is actually low. So they are low, now they are low paid. And what the um, incentive of the company is, is to undercut the current taxi market so that they can um, eventually um, form a monopoly. Okay, so is Uber and Uber type um, um, uh, situations a solution to the job market? Um, it very it fits in very nicely with the political realities that we've got now, which is of course the neoliberal reality, and we've got these people to, to blame for this. This is um, Milton Friedman, and uh, he of course put it in. The, it was it's a, a derivation on neoclass on, on classical economics, but it's uh, it's fundamentally something that was put into practice in Chile in a dictatorship in, in 1930, 1932, 1982. So he put it into practice and, and this is what has become our common sense understanding of how politics should be organized. Now central to this is that it is based on increased competition. Uh, neoliberalism is based on increase on the advocate, advocating of increased competition achieved through deregulation and a smaller state. Okay, so the smaller state is two minutes. Okay, so the smaller state is based on privatization, etc. Okay, so what does Marx say about this? Marx says that when he talks about the circuit of capital, which I'll show you, you start off with, in, uh, with production, you start off with money, the, the capitalist has money, then he gets, um, buys the product, i.e. The, the dress, becomes a commodity, then it becomes, he gets labor power to add to that, and the means of production, he's got the factory, and he produces the dresses and sells them. What you've got now, and the, then he gets more, he gets the dresses, and then he gets the uh, more money that he can reinvest in the system. What you've got now is you've got piecework. This is what Uber is. Uber is 
piecework. It's not time wages, it's piecework. And it goes into there, but it's still part, the, the important thing is that the surplus value still goes back disproportionately to the capitalists, to the money, and they are able to concentrate and centralise their power. Okay, that's Marx. So, when they say that things have changed, the reality is, is they haven't changed. That they've just become a new form, a new form of exploitation. That's what Marx talks about, exploitation. So it's a new form, fits in with the um, current neoliberal paradigm, and it's new. Okay, is there a way out for workers? So. Blockchain, you've heard about blockchain. You've heard about um, automation. Automation is, um, is when you've got um, robots taking over the driving of trucks uh, and you've got rid of your workers. Uh, blockchain is, okay, blockchain is when you're all sitting on your computer and you're doing Bitcoin. And uh, you've invested $40. Uh, if you're lucky, 14 years ago, it's now become $4,000. And you've got BitChain that is uh, a way of cooperating and so forth. And so this is seen by some, a guy called uh, Nathaniel Waters and another guy who was doing a lecture on em emeritus, emer oh, anyway, it doesn't matter, Ethereum. Okay, saying so this is the way to go. Okay, two seconds. One more, One more minute. Okay, but the problem with this is the same problem. Who owns BitChain? Uh, who, everybody says that they've got part, they, uh, they own the computer, but ultimately another problem is when everybody's using BitChain, it's cooperative, what's the regulation of that? Who ultimately owns it? And how have we got any guarantee that when everybody in the world is cooperating on BitChain, that it's going, not going to crash. <laughs> so there's all sorts of technical and other problems, but ultimately you need to have a government that's going to regulate and is going to control and based on social democracy. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That was a really great start. And um, next up is uh, Duncan. So step right up, Duncan. Hi there, thank you very much everyone for coming. I'm very glad I don't actually have a ticket for a counter over there. Um, or I might actually be wanting to have one in about five minutes time and I'll just skip off. Um, well, as I say, thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you for, to the organisers for giving us this opportunity to talk about our research here. It's, it's a very enjoyable thing to do, I hope. Um, I'm going to try and keep things actually very, very simple in that I'm going to talk about what is populism, I'm going to talk about um, who are the populists, and I'm going to consider whether populists are actually here to stay. Right? Um, I've worked on populism for quite a long time, over a decade, well before the media discovered it after Brexit and, uh, and Trump. It was, going along, it was going on and flourishing in, in Western Europe for many, many years before the Anglophone world discovered it last year. Um, I've, a lot of my research actually is based on talking to people within right-wing populist parties. So I've spoken to people in populist parties right across Europe and also in places like India and even Australia, because you have populists too here. Um, so to begin, what is, what is populism? It's, first of all, it's very much an abused term in the media. Uh, massively so. We find a huge galaxy of leaders described as populist, even The Economist, which has a style guide in which it prides itself on knowing how to use terms appropriately uh, in, in its magazine. The Economist, in the space of one week in 2013, referred to Kevin Rudd, Tony Abbott, the new mayor of New York, and the leader of Iran, all as populists. Um, I obviously have a problem with that because it makes no sense. Um, so what is populism? Populism, quite simply, proposes a view of society as divided into two. On the one hand, there are the bad elites. These may be political elites, financial, media, cultural, academics, like me, um, who are seen as oppressing a virtuous, homogenous people, okay? The silent majority of good, hard-working, decent living citizens who want nothing more than to be left to live in peace with their traditions and so on, not be bothered by politics and not have their sovereignty taken away from them by the elites. And that's very much the message of the populists, okay? So for all populists, whether they're of the left or of the right, society is divided into two. Bad elites, good people. For right-wing populists, 
it's slightly more complex in that the people are seen as being under siege from above by all the elites I've just mentioned, but also from below by a whole series of nasty, dangerous others. These can range from immigrants, it's the obvious choice. Muslims in particular come in for a bad rap from populists. The scene has been very dangerous, threatening to identity, traditions. But it can be a whole category of other others who for the populists don't fit into their definition of the people. So in Europe, for example, they may be homosexuals, they be me members of the Roma community in places like Hungary and Romania, they may be communists. They may simply be people with different behaviors, beliefs that just don't fit in with the idea of who the real people are. So to give you a more, more concrete and closer to home example of this, how many of you um, recall Pauline Hansen's maiden speech back in 1996? Some of you are probably too young. I see a, a, a few people uh, obviously have it burned into their, into their memory. Um, for those of you who didn't see it in 1996, you could watch it again in 2016. It's essentially the same. She just substituted Asians for Muslims. Okay? Um, Hansen, when she talks about the good people, who are they? She, she uses phrases like red-blooded Australians, like me. Um, they're, they're decent living mainstream Australia, silent majority, you're seeing the world around them change in terrible ways, their values destroyed, we can't even have nativity plays anymore, and, and, and all this type of messages. And the elites are obviously political elites in Canberra, big business, um, the media, and uh, academics, etc., etc. Her 1996 maiden speech is just textbook populism. In that sense, Hansen is very similar to the kind of populist, right-wing populist, that we've seen in Europe going back decades. People like Jean-Marie Le Pen and then his daughter Marine Le Pen of the French Front National, Umberto Bossi and his successor Matteo Salvini of the Italian Northern League, the Austrian Freedom Party, Danish People's Party, and so on and so forth. In Western Europe, it's very, very fertile terrain for, for populists. In that sense, yes, Hansen is very similar to these kind of populists that we've had in Europe. But there's a big difference, of course. She failed. Unlike Hansen, none of those populist leaders in Western Europe went on to star in Dancing in the Stars, for example. Okay? They continued in the political game. They succeeded where she failed. Why did Hansen fail? Well, the simple explanation for that, that's my ticket. Um, the, the simple explanation for that is that Hansen, although a great campaigner, is a terrible, terrible party leader. She does not know how to run a party. Her party organization skills are completely lacking. And that's the big difference between her and people like those who've been running the French Front National, Danish People's Party, and so on. It's been a different story in Western Europe. And as I said at the beginning, much predating Brexit and Trump and so on. In Western Europe, populists have been flourishing since the early 1990s. Their vote has increased very significantly over time. When they've had electoral setbacks, they haven't imploded, they haven't disappeared from the scene as Hansen did at the beginning of the century. No, they've recovered from that, they've gone on to even greater success. The reason for that, as I found in my research, traveling around, talking to people in populist parties, right from ministerial level down to the grassroots, is because these actually, in some ways, resemble old-style mass parties. What I mean by that is they actually have a grassroots presence. Populist parties in Europe, for the most part, do what mainstream parties don't do anymore. They're out there at markets, they're, they're out there helping people at local level. They're not just seen at election time. They're constantly present. Okay, and that's, that's, that's a big difference between populist parties and most centre-right and centre-left parties in Europe. And it's one of the reasons for the success. They've got a lasting presence, they know how to run a party. Now, as I said, populism has been alive and well in, in Europe for decades. It was doing absolutely fine before the GFC. If you think back about 15 years ago, Marine Le Pen's father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, got to the second round of the French presidential election. In the Netherlands, you had a right-wing populist party in government. In Italy, where I lived for a very long time, you had Silvio Berlusconi, a populist, alongside the Northern League, very much a radical right populist party, anti-immigration, anti-EU, and so on, in government for eight out of 11 years. So when you read the populism as a recent phenomenon, it's not. It really isn't. Um, how much time have we got left? Two minutes. OK, last point. Um, Populists are here to stay, at least in Europe. I don't think they're here to stay in Australia necessarily, but if they, well, if there are populists in the coming years in Australia, they won't be called Hansen, in my view. Her party will implode again, as it did before, because she seems to have learned very little about how to run a party in the last 20 years. Um, 
In Europe, it's a different story. But what I think is an interesting final commonality between the Australian case and the European ones is that what we're seeing now is that right-wing populists across Western democracies have been increasingly legitimized by mainstream parties. What I mean by that is that once upon a time, it was absolutely taboo for centre-right and centre-left parties to do business with populists. You couldn't do preference deals. You couldn't take them into coalition. That's completely changed in Europe. Since the turn of the century, from places like Norway, Finland, Denmark, right down to Italy and Greece, we've seen right-wing populists come into government. And you say, well, that couldn't happen in Australia. Really? If you think back to the Western Australian state election last year, what for me, as somebody who observes populism across Western democracies was very significant, was that the Liberals, just one year after Malcolm Turnbull said that Pauline Hanson had no place in Parliament, the Liberals did a preference deal with Hanson in Western Australia, and they're talking about doing the same here in Queensland. And that legitimization is one of the reasons why I think populists will be here to stay. They've been accepted into the political process, and we'll have to um, just accept that and uh, figure out how to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating and a bit scary. <laughs> um, thank you very much. John, up next. Thank you. I would like to apologise for the the dinging noise. It's quite loud when you're up here, so okay. don't be frightened. <laughs> Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is John Taig. I'm the managing editor at Griffith Review. Um, I just preferred a few remarks here about the long form essay, which is something we specialize in at Griffith Review, because I think it's basically going through a real renaissance at the moment. Um, not only in terms of its importance, as in our readers increasingly look into long-form writing as a way of making sense of the diverse com and complex tendencies at play in this moment, but also in terms of its reach. It is actually ideally placed to provide an overview of what's going on, to explore and to integrate apparently diverse phenomena, to reflect on the long-term and short-term forces at play, and in short, without wanting to sound too highfalutin here, reinvigorate an enlightenment project that has come under sceptical scrutiny, if not outright hostility, from various sides of the political and, and social spectrum during the past couple of decades. The rise in populist politics, be it Trump in the US, Brexit in the UK, the right-wing parties across Europe, and one nation here, has seen a number of related things at play. A questioning of science, a revival in a racially charged politics that held sway from the mid-19th century to the end of the Second World War, and the rise of what was widely termed fake news in an, in a, in a era of what's become known as post-truth politics. Fake news, though, seems to me to be a number of things. It's sometimes just infotainment, it's sometimes PR, just rumour, sometimes celebrity gossip, more dangerously propaganda mobilising the service of authoritarian and right-wing regimes, and sometimes it's just journalism, the endless recycling of apparently previously reported events. Usually it's a combination of these that's given a malign spin in service of an ideology that looks to question democracy and democratic institutions that have held sway in much of the West since 1945, if not before. But as my colleagues are pointing out, none of this is really new. The media is littered with examples of the past 30 years, whether it's in the UK, Sun's newspaper hounding mercilessly the Labour Party of Neil Kinnock and Jeremy Corbyn, or indeed how the Murdoch press treats the left in Australia. Of all the numerous reflection, uh, examples we could reflect on, I think the recent furore over the power blackouts that occurred in South Australia at the end of last year illustrate the phenomenon of fake news at its most insidious. The readiness of many news outlets, especially the ABC, to misreport and misconceive the problem solely has been about the adoption of renewable energy sources in South Australia, while neglecting to report a comment on the wholesale privatisation of the system of generation and distribution of electricity across the state and what this might mean. But the but I don't, well, it's not original to, for me to call out, to, to point out that uh, the mainstream media is in something of a crisis. The revenue models that underpin newspapers in the 20th century um, have kind of dried up to the point of drought. What the head of Fairfax once termed the rivers of gold, the enormous amount of money generated by classified advertising about housing, rentals, car sales, etc., have been diverted to the various websites that replace the once comprehensive classified sections in daily and weekend newspapers, and it leaves the newspaper revenue model high and dry. The effect of this is obvious. Wholesale redundancies of experienced staff and newspapers and media outlets, less long-term investigative work, less and less fact-checking of journalist sources and copy, 
and an over-reliance on secondary sources, i.e. stuff that's already been published or reported elsewhere. The ability of mainstream media to investigate, report and contest the facts has been severely diminished, and its reliance on the sort of journalism that gets recycled means it is as much a source becoming infected with the virus of misrepresentation as much as it attempts to contest it. Because obviously the decline in the press and mainstream media is also taking place with the absolute unprecedented boom in reporting, coming and thinking out loud that is the internet. In terms of the internet, I think it's fair to say that we're in an age of un unprecedented literacy in terms of the amount of people who are now writers, bloggers, citizen journalists, social media activists, activists, etc., etc., are now in one way or another involved in the public sphere and in terms that have never been witnessed before. This has created what might best be termed mixed results. There are more sources of independent writing than ever before, yet the maelstrom of voices can create too much confusion. Confusion often exploited by those who wish to further their own agendas, smear opponents, or circulate false rumours about individuals and organi organisations they wish to undermine. It's here, I, it's here where I think the long-form essay really comes into its own, as a way of investigating, commenting on, and making sense of what is going on, not just in politics, but in the reporting and discussion of politics, as the two are obviously intimately connected. Um, I studied English literature in the mid-1980s, just when it became apparent that what I termed the post-war consensus was probably not coming back, that the times were changing and what is the wave of neoliberal, neoliberalism was really gathering momentum. English literature as a subject cons was only considered respectful of to study at university back in the 1920s. It kind of hardly existed before then, and really only came into its own after the Second World War. Back then, the foundation of literary analysis was what was termed close reading, where well, the critic and one of the great architects of English literature as a university subject, I.A. Richards, termed a practical criticism. A painstaking analysis of the nuances inherent in the words that, that form a text, the derivation and resonance and ambiguity of its words, phrases and structures, and how these are integrated to form a work of literary art. But in the mid-1980s, that practice was beginning to change. The phenomenon of theory began to make itself felt in the literature departments of universities, and texts now become sites of deconstruction, of competing and unreconciled discourses, of modes of speech, uh, that challenged and resisted the totalizing voice of the grand narrative. Um, but it's also points out that in, to a certain extent, I think that wave of theory is now coming to a bit of an end. It's a bit like neoliberalism, it's getting exhausted. Um, and I can think it's in terms of long-form essay where we considered the, uh, what was once considered disregarded concepts of close reading is now coming back. While fake news has risen, there's been a related rise in the power of critical readers to examine, analyse and debunk the fakery and misrepresentation on show, to challenge the smears, to time the calmly point to error and to illuminate the situation with calm and analytical commentary. In fact, in the space of long-form essay, I think there's a new impetus towards unifying the difference in tendencies both in close reading and in the wide-ranging view of theory, because the best long-form long essays at the moment are combining patient close reading when it comes to analysing commentary, essays, blogs and social media posts for their truth or falsity content with a necessary ability to put such small examples into a larger perspective, a grand narrative, if you will, of where we are now, where we have come from and just what might be going on. Because obviously the phenomenon of Trump, Brexit, the rise of the right across Europe and the rebirth of one nation Australia, we're not dealing with unprecedented factors and forces. If anything, we're, re we're witnessing the re-emergence in tendencies old and familiar but given new clothes, new images, new impetus in the area when its obvious economic models have failed to deliver. When the press and media is in decline, when there's been an unprecedented rise in the generation dissemination of various voices via new technology. And the energy in the long-form essay is coming not just from writers, but from readers also. It seems to me there's an unprecedented hunger for lucid historical analysis among readers, for writing that draws together various trends and tendencies into an authoritative overview that makes sense of this moment in all its variety. Once there was, once there was an exhortation to overthrow the grand narrative in favour of the small stories that circulate in the culture, but I think in times of confusion, we look to the long view to make sense of the present. And this, I think, is at the heart of the revival in the long-form essay as a vital form that is needed to locate us in this new territory. We're once again things that we thought were solid are melting into air. This is what we look to for Griff at Griffith Review for our populism edition. We look for two things, the personal story, 
which we regularly include as memoir or reportage that connects with the large attendances of the day. This was the case with Andrew Stafford, who reflected an experience of becoming the media story when he experienced an episode in which he disappeared for a couple of days and deleted his social media accounts. Or it's something we look for with Lec Blaine, a young writer. He tells a terrible story of how his family was stalked by notorious religious fanatics during the 1990s. But we also look for a more wide-ranging analysis. Rod Tiffin wrote on the phenomenon of restorationism, of the false nostalgia for a non-existent past that underpins much popular sentiment. Dennis Olman looks at how the sentiment that political correctness has gone mad, that again, that also underpins much popular complaint, is really just old prejudices giving you clothes. And Michael Winkler looks at the tradition of anti-populist satire that has been evident in the culture since the late 19th century and concludes that satire, while voicing anger, has little lasting effects as a political tool and in fact can become somewhat counterproductive. In all of these pieces, plus more, we see a patient and constructive engagement with the populist phenomena that puts so much of its apparent sturm und drang into perspective. In a world in which so much debate has become close-focused, rather shrill and short-lived, it's these perspectives that are needed more than ever. And it's in long form essay that they're best evidenced and best expressed. So, order your copy now. <laughs> thank you, John. And last but definitely not least, mm -hmm. Susanna, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, this comes as a bit of a surprise to me too. Uh, so I started to think when I was asked to do this talk yesterday <coughs> about what on earth could I talk about given the topic that we were looking at and I thought what the heck is populism? So I pulled out my Oxford English Dictionary ah it's a movement of the people okay which people what kind of movement and then I started to think about experiences I've had. I started off as an anthropologist almost 30 years ago and one of the things that I remember very strongly from anthropology is that anthropologists tend to divide human societies into two kinds of groups. One group which is to be found amongst for example our indigenous population, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are groups that are called acephalous. That means there is no head, everybody gets a say on how the whole group is governed. The other kind of group is where there's some kind of elite. Now this is true even in Indigenous communities. One of the comparisons between Australian Indigenous people and New Zealand Indigenous people, for example, is that the Maori and throughout Polynesia there is a system of the rangatira, which are the aristocrats, the people who inherit the responsibility for the rest of the society, not necessarily to become the elite. Duncan made a point that populist movements tend to be this separation of eh, this separation of one group that believes itself to be the real people and the other group who are the bad, the elite. You know, this is an idea that's occurred to other people beforehand, including to a guy called Solon. Now, Solon was a Greek, he was an Athenian, he thought that Athens was going to be the greatest empire in the world, and he wrote a constitution, which I just recently saw, seven metres long. Seven metres long of papyrus, written by Aristotle. If you've got to have somebody as your secretary, I guess Aristotle's a good guy to go to. But the constitution that Solon developed was in order to overcome the kind of government that the Greek society had had or the Athenian society had had before, which was the government by an elite, by the tyrannos, the tyrants. And instead, he wanted to replace it with something which he called democratia that is the rule of the people and the kind of democracy that he was talking about was one of actual participant democracy as long as you're a man of course and not a slave or a woman you know you had you had to be there and you had to talk up and you would literally get roped in so that you could vote on the important things so democracy is this notion of the rule by the people for the people what else did link? Of the people. 
Thank you, Abraham Lincoln and Georgina, for reminding me where that came from. Um, and it was a notion that started to gain currency. I personally believe that the Greeks actually stole it from the Phoenicians, but that's a whole other talk, so we won't go there. It spread so far that you had not much longer later, a couple of hundred years, the development of the Roman Republic. And the Romans too kicked out the bunch of people who were running the place, the ones who were the elites. It was a popular movement. And the establishment of the Roman Republic is remembered in the four letters. I'm sure you've seen them if you've been to Europe, SPQR, which doesn't just stand for spelling, proofreading, if you answer the question of your reference. It stands for, <laughs> sorry, too much, too much teaching in my past. It stands for Senatus Populusque Quirinus Romanus, which means the Senate and the people of the Quirinal of Rome. The Quirinal's the hill on which actually, even to this day, the Roman Senate is located. Or the President's Palace, I can't remember which one of those two. When it came to Berlusconi. But the thing about both the Greeks and the Romans was that they believed that government had to be a popular process. Everybody had to be involved. What happened? Where did it all go wrong? Um, I have two words for you. Church. <clears throat> the Holy Roman Empire Incorporated brought in this notion again that God ruled and God ruled through the prince, through the one person or through the elite who would know God's word. So it was the church and the people who knew best. In fact, populist movements aren't new. But for a very, very long time, probably until about the 16th century when the Renaissance started to break apart ideas about who should rule and how they would have God's mandate to rule, you didn't have, you had peasants' revolts, but you didn't have real populist movements. The real populist movements started to come in the 17th and 18th century. You can't count the English Civil War. I have still no idea what they were doing. It was very strange, that thing. But the French Revolution, arguably, was a populist movement. One of the characteristics of early populist movements was they tended to be acephalous. They didn't have distinct leaders. But they also didn't have one simple ideology. They didn't have a positioning either on left or right. The point of the populist movements that led to the revolutions, the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848, even the Russian Revolution, these were movements that wanted to get power back into the hands of the people. Other populist movements which sit on the left side of politics, <coughs> feminism, women's suffrage. This was a populist movement. It just happened to be the people who'd been neglected and who hadn't been counted as being citizens or active parts of the government beforehand. Pretty much the same thing could be said of the civil rights movements of the 60s and the, the LG, LGBTQA, I have to get them all in these days, the gay pride movements of the 70s. Really, the populist movements that we've seen have been both left and right. It hasn't all been Nazis and fascism. It hasn't all been Hitler and Mussolini. It has also been Germaine Greer and Gloria Steinem. It's been Harvey Milk. Two minutes. Good. Um, so I just want to talk about the implications for two minutes. I did enough preparation for five hours, but you know. I'm <laughs> Why are populist movements gaining ground in the 20th century? There's a guy called Louis de Mont who back in the 1960s wrote a book called Homo Hierarchicus. And one of the things that de Mont argues in Homo Hierarchicus is that as societies become more individualistic, there is a greater chance of the development of a need for some kind of overarching 
populist movement usually, he argues, that will be led by demagogues and very often will be ultra-conservative. Is this what's happening now? This is one of the questions I'm asking. Are we getting more individualistic? And where does social media play a role in this? It's one of the big questions for me in populism. It's not just that people can spread information, it's there's a growing expectation, it seems to me, and we saw this actually in the last American election. There's a growing expectation that everybody should participate in the processes of government. And when I say this came out in the last election, it wasn't just that one nation interfered with another nation. What happened was that there were thousands and thousands of requests for people to be able to cast their vote on social media. To be able to, you know, can I just hit this email, can I tw tweet this, can I actually say what I think through social media. So it leads me to ask, when we're talking about movements of the people, we have to ask which people, how do they want to participate? I think the points that were made earlier that that notion of the good people is a very strong one. The notion that we're being oppressed by those who have the power and those who are even less powerful than we are is something that has become almost um, commonplace. But I don't think that there's just one kind of populism. I think there are multiple kinds of populism. And I'm still going to keep asking the question, which populism are you talking about? And what the heck is this thing that's going on? And who was that guy anyway? <laughs> How did we get to Brexit and Trump? I, uh, I, uh, that's my response anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>